few of them. So compliments to the team. Thanks, Surat. Thanks, Surat. Thank you. So tell me, KK, whenever you want to cut to live, and we'll start. Yeah. Okay. As soon as the video ends, I'll, I'll call you. Okay. We'll go. Kumar, the previous question was right. Turning to your right, left, sorry, left. This ah, that's that's good. That's good. Yeah. Good morning from wherever, whichever part of the world you are in. Uh, a warm welcome to you all uh, to another edition of uh, BBD, that is the Business and Banking Dialogue. My name is KK, and I am the host for today's show, which is live across EPS channel, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Our today's show is titled "Igniting Economic Growth with Instant Payments." We are talking about uh, payments. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as many major economies are destined to slip into recession this year, uh, India is no exception. So Indians living in those countries are also likely to send less far less far less money back home. In India, remittances are projected to fall by about close to 20% to USD 64 billion in 2020, compared to a growth of Five growth rate of 5.5 percent and receipts of over 83 billion in 2019. That's the uh, numbers of World Bank report. The effect of coronavirus is expected to be visible in the form of global slowdown and travel restrictions, which will also affect migratory movements, keeping remittances subdued even in 2021. That's again what's the The uh, World Bank report has stated. Meanwhile, the lockdown in India has impacted the livelihoods of nearly four crore people in India, out of which nearly close to maybe a one crore migrants have moved from urban centers to rural areas in the span of, uh, you know, uh, in the span of over the last three months or so. What's the? This will further reduce remittances and transfers this year. So, what's the road ahead? Let's discuss with the person who was at the helm of India Post Payments Bank, Mr. Suresh Sethi. 
Mr. Suresh Sethi is the MD CEO designate for NSDL e-governance. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be aware that one of the payments, one of the payments bank license was given to India Post. A policy decision by RBI, which has major impact financial, financial, uh, 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 the way we work in financials uh, for the remittances, particularly for the unbanked population in far remote areas and for the banked population with families deciding uh, not in the place of work uh, where, the, where they work. Uh, Suresh has over three decades of diversified global experience in the financial services industry. In his last role as the founder, CEO, and MD of India Post Payments, he is credited, credited with creating large interoperable banking infrastructure for public good at scale and you know because of this sheer reach of uh, india uh, india payments uh, india uh, post payments uh, that's where remittances are expected to uh, you know multifold increase prior to india post payments bank you has worked with some of the world's and leading uh, india's leading financial services companies such as city group yes bank and Vodafone, M-Pesa across India, Kenya, UK, Argentina, and US. He has held senior CXO and managing director level positions at regional and global levels. For his contribution to the banking, to the financial sector, Suresh has been recognized as the Asian banker. He was also recognized as the CEO of the year at the India Banking Summit Awards 2019 so, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Sethi, and welcome to the Business and Banking Dialogue. Good afternoon, KK. Thanks for Thank your kind you. introduction. Thank you for coming and uh, spending some time with us. I know you have a very busy schedule, uh, but thanks for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, coming over. And uh, so, so let's get into the, uh, you know, into the uh, way we want to do it. Uh, we want to get the instant, uh, the, the payments uh, topic up. So you have, uh, you know, you uh, you have be, uh, you you have been with a rich experience of M-Pesa, right? Uh, the, the Kenyan the Kenyan uh, uh, instant payment and in, and India Post Payments Bank. How these two biggest successes in Kenya and India have created an impact in Kenya and India, respectively, while creating a shift from paper-based payment modes to digital modes of payment. So, okay, appropriate comparisons, and I think uh, M-Pesa Kenya has been a globally accredited study in how mobile financial services have been able to create a livelihood impact in a country and has been able to be successfully lift people out of poverty. So I think there's a huge learning starting from there. Uh, it is the first uh, at scale implementation of mobile financial services. Uh, which was able to achieve a critical mass and have a wide-ranging impact. I will talk about some of the learnings from M-Pesa and the impact that it created and how we draw parallels with what an institution like the Department of Post and India Post Payment Bank can likewise achieve and has achieved in the Indian context. Uh, M-Pesa started uh, as a mobile financial service, which was primarily uh, being used to enable disbursement of subsidy. That is actually where it all started because you're talking about a country where again, the banking infrastructure was limited, had limited penetration. And uh, there was a reach out to the telecom services to say that can we look at mobiles and the physical distribution of a telecom to enable subsidy distribution and make it reach the hands of the uh, beneficiaries or the individuals who were due to receive that subsidy. So that is how it all started. And uh, as we've seen over a period of time, uh, it became a household sort of uh, name. The uh, uh, last known, the M-Pesa services are used more than 80% adult population in Kenya is actually a subscriber to M-Pesa services. So M-Pesa services is what? It is simply basically 
doing your remittances, being able to receive money, being able to transfer money from your mobile. Uh, it is about creating a mobile-based account from where you can move the money to and fro. Uh, now, what it equally required or what was critical was a penetration of a physical network, an agent. Because here again, we are talking about conversion of cash into digital, the ability of digital money to move from one mobile to the other, and therefore uh, eliminating the physical reach, but allowing people to send money through digital channels. But at the same time, cash again becomes a very dominant uh, actor in the whole play because people still hold cash, they need to convert it into digital. And again, at the same time, when people receive a remittance, they need to convert uh, the digital money into cash. So it becomes equally important that you have a physical network out there which can enable this exchange of uh, currency from cash to digital and likewise from digital to cash. Uh, naturally, the long-term uh, focus again is that people start consuming goods and services and pay for them digitally, but that, that always is a progression. It follows, the, it follows the cycle. So in Kenya, if you see, it was, it was primarily led by the fact that people had a mobile. Uh, the other big factor which came into play, which, which made this a reality, was the fact that people had a national identity. So your KYC was addressed. When you want to send money or subsidy to somebody, you needed to be able to identify the person. So there was a national identity already existing in Kenya. Uh, there was a telecom player, in this case, Safaricom, which almost had a dominant, and when I say dominant, it was almost 85% plus market share. So anybody having a mobile, eight out of 10 people would be running on the Safaricom network. And last but not the least equally critical was the telecom physical distribution, agents across the country. Now to cut it short and bring it to where it finally came to, uh, so at a point of time, M-Pesa almost had 125,000 agents across the country. And the outcomes which were measured, and there was a detailed study done by MIT, which went in to study what was the impact. And the impact that was brought about was that uh, with this sort of penetration of M-Pesa, almost, there was an almost 2% increase in per capita consumption. And 2% of the households were lifted out of extreme poverty. As per World Bank uh, definition, extreme poverty is earning of uh, $1.25. One, one and, uh, and these people moved above that. So that was a very significant impact. Now let's, let's cut to India and I want to do some of the comparisons. Now again, when we look at the Indian ecosystem, we are talking about a overall bank branch uh, network of say 150,000 odd bank branches across the country. Uh, when we go to rural India, the number of bank branches come down drastically. So we are talking about all, uh, around 50,000 bank branches which have presence in rural India. If we look at some statistics, uh, then clearly for anybody to access a bank branch, you are talking about a distance of 13 to 15 kilometers on the average. Uh, so when we look at an institution like India Post, uh, clearly the intent of the government was to press a government infrastructure to create scale to enable financial inclusion. Uh, we are talking of almost 155,000 post offices. 85% above post offices are in rural India. So once the bank was created and established, we today have 135,000 India Post Post offices which serve as bank outlets. What did this mean effectively? Earlier where uh, one bank outlet was, uh, or one bank branch was serving 4,200 villages, we brought it down to one bank branch now serving around 1,000 uh, villages. And the fact that there are almost 300,000 postal employees who we all know traditionally have been doing the work of delivering mail to our houses or even enabling money orders or telegrams as used to be you know, done historically, they've been enabling that reach. Now, what we also did in India Post Payment Bank was we enabled almost 190,000 plus Grameen Dark Savaks and Postmen with a smartphone and a biometric device to provide banking at the doorstep. Now, if you see, there are, there are similarities over here. By, yeah. by getting the ability 
of people to actually go to a person's house and do banking, you reduce the distance to a bank to zero. So anybody can actually get banking services right at their doorstep. So that is a big leap forward because again, I'll, I'll keep switching between M-Pesa and India. In M-Pesa, it was determined that wherever agent density, and they defined agent density as the number of agents within one kilometer of a household. Wherever agent density was increased by five, there was a 6% increase in per capita income in the households surrounding that area. Now, as we all know, when we talk about financial inclusion and penetration, one of the first things we talk about is access. So in India, access to bank accounts, access to yeah. financial inclusions was enabled through the Jandhan scheme, where almost today, we know that 377 million bank accounts were opened. Now, 80% plus of Indian population, again, today has a bank account. But the challenge remained about the last mile reach. Uh, India, again, uh, has the record that we today have almost 48% inactivity or dormancy in bank accounts at an aggregate level. Now, the reach is what, what determines whether an account is active or not. And that is where an entity like India Post Payment Bank came in. And we were able to increase the rural banking infrastructure by two and a half times, bringing the bank to the doorstep of the individual. And that, in effect, created the right enablers for any bank to have a last mile reach through India Post Payment Bank. So clearly there are similarities. It is, it is about, first of all, and, and yes. which is the parallels I'll draw, it is about having an identity. So Aadhaar in India, again, became the fulcrum of a lot of this financial inclusion. A national identity at scale, that is number one. Yes. Uh, number two, clearly, is a payment settlement system, uh, which, uh, which is at scale and which, which is interoperable and drives adoption. Uh, the government-driven initiatives of Jandhan, which provides access, everybody has a bank account. And last but not the least, the agent density or the distribution density to be able to drive usage, which means people are able to access their banking services and they are able to operate these accounts. That is what then drives us towards increased per capita consumption and the other good things which come along with upliftment of people and an impact on livelihoods. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, you did compare, I think, uh, uh, Kenya and India. So uh, if you look at the Kenya, the, the one simple slogan they started was send home money or right. send money home. Okay, I think that's, that's, that's the three words they use, send money home. That really caught on in Kenya. And uh, uh, that simple slogan that Kenyans caught on, much like India, the local population sent money through friends, families, post banks, but all came with issues of safety, ability, and efficiency. And so when M-Pesa was introduced, it became an instant hit. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But I think, Suresh, there is one big dissimilarity between Kenya and India. A, I think, is, the, is a much uh, vast, uh, you know, vast hinterland, if I may say so, remote areas, much, much bigger. Uh, the population is much, much bigger. And uh, perhaps the, the level of education uh, to use uh, smartphones for doing uh, remittances. Uh, yeah, yeah any, any thoughts on that? Because you said agent density is high. Uh, I think agent density uh, in, in India uh, perhaps is not that, uh, that high as, as uh, the population that we have. Your thoughts? Yeah, sure. I think that's a, that's a good observation, uh, KK. Two points to it. Uh, first of all, uh, yes. I agree with you, a very diverse geography, much larger. Yeah. Uh, we are talking yes. about, you know, a country which is probably smaller than, you know, most of our states. So sheer geographic, you know, expanse is very different when we look at India versus probably anywhere in the world, because when we talk numbers, they are much, much larger. Uh, so one, one or, or two or three things I will call out over here. One is if you see that our payment settlement systems are interoperable. So that is a big difference. Yeah. Uh, Kenya had the benefit, and it played to their benefit, of having one dominant player who was available across the country. I'm talking about the telecom provider. Yes. So they could actually use one entity and try to create the reach. 
in a country like ours, you have no single player who can actually fan across the country and provide services everywhere. So I think the, the fact that our payment and settlement systems, the way they have been architected, the architecture is open in nature. It is interoperable, which allows all banks to ride on the same infrastructure. Uh, we've gone yeah. a step ahead and we've allowed BitTech to ride on it. So, you know, today, as per uh, regulatory, uh, you know, allowances, uh, even a company like uh, Google Pay or a Phone Pay or WhatsApp, they're all riding on the same interoperable payment settlement technology. So interoperability is critical for us to be able to create scale and create the network. Uh, thirdly, as you rightly call out, physical agent density, and that is, that is uh, which becomes a very critical part, and smartphone penetration and digital literacy, right? So these are yeah. three factors you called, which are, which are for us a, a challenge, uh, you know, in our own ecosystem and how do we tackle it? So let me first start by saying when I look at digital literacy and smartphone, uh, you know, ownership. I'll, I'll take these yeah. two together. Now sure. you look at digital literacy, I, I completely agree with you. It is, it is difficult to assume that everybody will become savvy, will adopt technology and start, you know, transacting remotely or using whatever channels become available to them. And that is, that was one of the, that was again, one of the critical decisions when we looked at India Post Payment Bank the idea was to provide assisted banking. So even when we provide doorstep yeah. banking, our first mission was to enable the Dakia with a smartphone and a biometric device so that the Dakia can go to the house of the villager and actually help them to operate their account, operate their account for a remittance, yeah. operate their account for receiving their DBT transfers, operate their account for making bill payments, but it was an assisted service. So our first yeah. milestone was to make sure that the Dakias, and, and in this case, we are talking, when we did the training, we trained 250,000 post, postal employees to provide banking services. So they were certified as per RBI norms to act as banking service agents. And there was a full-fledged certification program which, through which they went and they were, they were actually uh, scored on it, they were provided certification, and then they went to the field. So digital literacy for us to started first with the agent, and then we are now in the process where these people educate the end consumer to adopt digital services, to understand about you know financial literacy. Again, very important because uh, when I'm going to a villager, it is not just about opening a bank account. You have to teach them the value of saving, you have to educate them about insurance uh, in terms of securing uh, their livelihood and lives in terms of investments, where all they can invest. So these are a lot of things which, which, are, which are part and parcel of the digital literacy program. So net net, what we are saying is for us, digital literacy starts with first enabling a set of people who can provide the assisted services and in the process, educate and bring a larger set of end consumers to become part of this ecosystem. So that is all about the uh, digital literacy and the assisted services, which therefore also means that yeah. today, uh, and I will, I will definitely like to touch upon it. If we look at our, uh, again, our payment settlement systems and, and our national identity uh, infrastructure, we are today talking about being able to offer digital services, even to people who don't have a smartphone, who don't have a device. Today, somebody can actually walk to an agent and just give their Aadhaar number and their thumbprint is good enough to put on a biometric device and generate an electronic or a digital transaction, debiting their account and you know, transferring money to somebody else's account. Or similarly, if you've received subsidy in your account, you can actually walk to the agent or in our case at India Post, the Dakia can come to your house. You virtually give your Aadhaar number put your uh, thumbprint on the biometric device and you can withdraw your subsidy amount from any bank account. So we are able to today address people who don't have a device at all. And the other part, which is, which is very relevant is about creating the physical infrastructure. When we look at the physical infrastructure, it is again today interoperable thanks to the interoperable payment settlement systems like AEPS. And here I would uh, again, you know, sort of, I, I alluded to it just shortly ago, Today, when we look at even the India Post network or for that matter, any bank, 
because we have an Aadhaar enabled payment system as an interoperable network, the fact that we are today seeding the bank accounts with an Aadhaar number, today any bank agent can actually provide banking services for any other bank. And uh, I will, I always like to talk about this example, not so many years ago, maybe a decade ago, uh, we are all familiar with the fact that if you opened a bank account, we could only go to the bank branch in which we have opened the account and do our banking services. Even if yes, you went to another bank, branch of the same bank, you would not have access yeah. to your banking services, right? So that is where we started Absolutely, the journey. Yeah. Now with the introduction of core banking systems, which was again, you know, driven very strongly by the regulator of all the people, uh, banks provided a capability where you could go to any bank branch and operate your account. So this is where we talked about the host branch and, uh, and uh, serving branch and that entire concept came into play. So you could be sitting in a different city, you go to the same bra uh, branch of the bank and, and enjoy, uh, you know, banking services. But today see where we have reached. Today, uh, I'll, I'll give a simple example of India Post Payment Bank. When a Dakia comes to your house, you can access your banking account with any bank. As yes. long as the account is Aadhaar seeded and you can operate that account. So by virtue of that, we have today made the entire physical infrastructure of whether it is India Post as a singular institution or whether it is, you know, multiple banks having business correspondent networks. This entire network has become interoperable and one entity can service the customers of another entity. And this interoperability has brought out the scale in our country, which otherwise would have been very difficult to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a wonderful statistics and a good comparison. And uh, thank you for that. And I think uh, uh, telling us uh, how, how we are different yet we are, we are there and we are making a big difference. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Suresh. Uh, we will uh, we'll go further into the into our discussion. So it is, uh, Suresh, it's interesting to note that while M-Pesta uh, contributed to poverty eradication, you, you, you told us that uh, I, uh, almost 2% of the population of Kenya was pulled out of from extreme poverty. Okay, that's just, I think you said extreme poverty means uh, less than uh, one or two dollars uh, earnings. Okay, which is which is I think a tremendous uh, that remitt remittance can do. Uh, India Post India payment uh, banks have played a significant role in providing credit and saving services. Two important uh, aspects: credit and saving services to the underbanked villages, which has strengthened the rural economy. There's no, no doubt about it. Tell us more about these path breaking successes in, in, uh, in, the, in the two countries on, on these slides. So I think first talking about overall, you know, eradication and impact on livelihood as, as we were talking about. Uh, Kenya, while, while these numbers are there and they are part of a, you know, study, or a study was done by MIT for a period of almost eight to nine years where they mm -hmm. did comparisons and they came out with these numbers. Uh, the other big, area which they which they were able to discover out of this entire uh, study was the fact that there was a significant upliftment of women women became a part of the ecosystem and yeah. this was you know gender focused and it created a difference to the effect that women headed households showed better results than male headed households and almost uh, at a point in study, they've mentioned that 185,000 women moved out of uh, farming as a livelihood into other businesses. So there was a clear difference in empowering the women and bringing them into the ecosystem of uh, inclusion in, in the ecosystem of the economy. And that I think also was a very, very significant factor to note. Uh, now, when we look at India and, and I will just sort of, uh, you know, Correct one point, India Post Payment Bank, being a payment bank, we don't offer credit services. So we okay. are today enabling people to save their money with us, do money transfer and so on and so forth. But credit services are not there. But at the same time, as per regulations, the bank can tie up with other banking institutions and provide credit, which is underwritten by the other uh, institution, the other scheduled commercial bank. Uh, but but the difference we see, so a couple of things, I think let's put it in context. Uh, if you look at the fact we are today sitting in the middle of a crisis, uh, yes. which I think 
six months ago or when the year started, we had no idea that we will be sitting in this sort of, you know, uh, uh, restricted environment uh, where digital will become very critical. And uh, now as we look at it in hindsight, some of the policies of the government, some of the uh, policies of the regulator, the interventions that have been created at scale actually gave us the ability, our government the ability to have a very quick response in this scenario. And I will, I will come to the point that today on one side, it is about reigniting the demand and supply. Yeah. So you're talking about people who today have suddenly lost their livelihood. Uh, India, again, has a huge informal workforce. 80% of the workforce is informal in nature, which is what we term as part of our gig economy. And these people have a daily earning. So they do work yeah. during the day and they get paid at the end of the day for their services. So when something like a pandemic, the nature we are facing today, it comes through, these guys don't have a security or a, or a social security net on which they can lean back. Their livelihood goes away. I think one side where the government has played a role, leveraging this entire investment over a period of time has, deep, has been to, in the form of a welfare state, be able to push benefits to the people at the last mile. And the best way to do it is to put money in the hand of the person. And I think our yes. entire ecosystem where today people have a bank account, We've got interoperable payment and settlement systems. Government subsidy has been pushed at whatever value the government deemed fit, which means we can do transactions of any size and have them in the hands of the people at the last mile. And we have a physical ecosystem today to also ensure that in case somebody cannot go to a bank branch, we can deliver cash to your doorstep. Now, an entity like India Post Payment Bank has paid a very, very... Uh, you know, important role in this entire ecosystem because today through the Dakia, we've been able to deliver cash to people at their house and cash against subsidy, which has come into any bank account of the individual concerned. Uh, even during the, during the course of these last few months in the shutdown, uh, India Post Payment Bank has delivered over 4,000 crores of cash directly to households, serving customers of all banks. Now, that has been a very, very important factor which has played. Uh, now, talking about long-term effects and which, which, you know, going out of the, you know, the context of the lockdown and the pandemic. Uh, the other area is then how do we really make people a part of the ecosystem? So, as you are able to move money back and forth, uh, we also, again, have a huge population, which is a migrant population. And these people do need the... Uh, ability to send money home through secure channels, uh, through channels which they can trust. And that is where institutions which are, which are uh, you know, set at scale, which have the backing of the regulator, which have the backing of the government, uh, which are run by top-notch financial institutions, uh, they play a big role in generating trust and having people use their services to do this uh, money transfers. On the receiving end, it becomes equally important to create an ecosystem of acceptance. Because as we are all talking about digital, today the other side is the, <clears throat> so one was the supply side, the other side is the demand side. Now today, a lot of businesses are no longer yeah. able to run their businesses. So what we are seeing is there's a lot of dependence again on tech to be able to create mechanisms in which people can procure digitally and you are able to supply goods and you can get paid likewise in a digital manner. So it is not, we are, as, as we've also seen during the pandemic and otherwise, we are also trying to eliminate cash in the system. Now cash, as we all know, traditionally also has a cost to managing it. If we are able to get more and more cash out of the system and people are able to consume their uh, goods and services digitally, that will also straight away have a direct impact on the financial economy, on the GDP of the country. And that we today are seeing is also getting driven by the current restricted uh, scenario where a lot of the MSME sector is today coming and uh, providing services which can be procured digitally and can be consumed and paid for digitally. And that is again becoming a very, very important uh, directional change, uh, which I would assume is now getting, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
institutionalized in a much more faster manner than would have done in the normal course of business. A lot of businesses today are moving to digital and uh, they have plans where they had originally thought about doing it over the next you know, two or three years. And these have been truncated and brought forward to two or three months because it's all yes. about survival. So I think that is, that is where institutions like these will make a difference. The outcomes, we'll have to wait and see how they, how they impact. But uh, it will clearly trigger more behavior changes. Uh, it, the demand and supply and the information asymmetry will clearly have an impact and people will adopt these things much faster. And I think these are things which are, which are changes which are there to last and we don't see them getting you know, reversed over a period of time. Yes, thank you, Suresh. Uh, very good explanation on that. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we continue to talk to Suresh uh, on the remittances and how they play a very important part in our economy. Uh, we are talking about reigniting uh, the or igniting the remittances uh, in India and from abroad. And so, while we continue to have discussion, you, you are uh, free to start asking your questions, uh, what you may have. Uh, to uh, Suresh and you will try to get it across. Uh, we have uh, S- uh, Suresh a caller from Chennai, uh, Tyaga Rajan. He would like to ask you a question. Tyaga, can you please unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi, Sethi. Uh, good to see you back on our platform and uh, very depth. Yeah, hi. Very uh, depth information and quite uh, insightful. Uh, having uh, been you driving one of the largest payment banks in India. And uh, we got a very good bird's eye view on uh, the payment system on the financial inclusion. Having said, my question uh, is on how to increase, uh, let's say, the digital payments for migrant workers. You did touch base on uh, the disbursement of uh, the benefits from government like DBT. And also in this pandemic, we saw the government distribution of uh, 6,000 rupees to the Kisan. But uh, the migrant workers are, you know, it doesn't have a kind of base. They keep shifting the basis. I mean, the point. So the point is how to increase the digital adoption for the migrant workers and, and how to increase the, uh, the digital payments for the migrant workers. Probably your experience, uh, we could hear uh, what is the kind of uh, the, view, the, the strategy or how, how this could be implemented. I think if you, if you see, Tiagan, uh, overall, the fact is that for all these people, the starting point is to have access. So, you know, people today have bank accounts. The second part is how do you drive usage? And uh, we have known traditionally that uh, India does have a very strong, you know, migrant worker base. And this includes, you know, uh, at at an aggregate or a gross level, this includes all sorts of people. A lot of us probably on this call are migrants. We are not uh, really working in the place where we were born. But then there are the blue collar migrants and there are people who are moving from states. There are there are less opportunities to bigger uh, cities like uh, Mumbai and uh, Delhi to earn livelihood. So the need to send money back home has always been there. Now, traditionally, multiple channels have been available to people to do uh, send their money back home uh, right from, you know, uh, even uh, talk, talk about physical challenges or, uh, or channels or sending cash back home uh, to, a, to a scenario where you have payment settlement systems where you can transfer money point to point on a real time basis and uh, similarly get the confirmation coming to you on a real time basis. So I think the efficiency of the ecosystem, the trust that you build with the ecosystem, that is the starting point because uh, even in India, when we, for example, introduced mobile financial services along the lines of M-Pesa. I think the first uh, challenge clearly was I'm giving my cash. Now the money will, you know, go through an agent from point to point. Can I trust the agent? Uh, How do we build the trust in the agent ecosystem? So there have been progressive regulations. Uh, The business correspondent regulations of the Reserve Bank of India uh, were able to create an agent network, which was bank sponsored. So that brought you uh, a trust factor where you said there's a banking entity sitting behind the agent who's actually serving my needs. And the agent network itself created the wider reach and expanse, which a bank branch would not have been able to provide. Second was clearly about digital literacy. Now, even if your money is coming uh, uh, to the village and let's say it's landing on a mobile, uh, the people left back home 
are even less literate than the people who are probably coming to the town to earn the livelihood. So it was about digital literacy. It could be elderly parents, it could be parents, it could be wives, it could be children who are sitting back home. How do you enable them and, uh, and give them the digital literacy to be able to trust a digital mode of money reaching them? And similarly, can you point, provide them points of service? Uh, if there is no you know, digital ecosystem in the village where they can actually go and withdraw the money. So these have been steps which have, uh, which have uh, happened over a period of time. And, and I think the outcomes are clearly there to see. Uh, I remember not that very long ago, even uh, you know, when we were uh, starting the MPESA journey in India, we actually used to talk about the 30-30-30, that 30% 30, 30 of the money transfer for migrants is happening through the uh, formal banking channels, which means you go to an agent which is bank sponsored, you use payment settlement systems like NEFT or IMPS and money is transferred to the village. 30% uh, of money was still uh, going with the postal ecosystem through the money orders. Right. And the remaining was still, you know, sort of unorganized sector where you're talking about the Hwala, you're talking about somebody going to the village and you giving cash. And today, if we see a dominant chunk has moved into the banking ecosystem and moving through formal channels. And the reason for formal channels uh, becoming the dominant uh, owners of this share of market is clearly driven by trust. It is driven by the efficiency of the service, which means you don't have delays. It is uh, driven by the fact that you have information how your money is moving. And last but not the least, it is also about the fact that in the rural ecosystem, again, measures have been created in which money can be received safely. So I think that change is already there to see. So remittances have therefore built and over a period of time have significantly increased into the formal channel from the informal channel. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Thanks. 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 Thanks, Suresh. Thanks, Suresh. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Suresh, heavy reliance on cash leads to uh, anonymity in business and personal transactions, as we all know, and the government is, want, doesn't want cash to move so much. Uh, such an informal economy has financial implications in the form of reduced tax collections and low GDP. What are your observations about the role of instant payments in unlocking the formal economy? So I think there are two parts to it, uh, KK. One clearly is that uh, other measures outside what we spoke about just now, which is more about digital ecosystem creation, trust, providing access, providing usage capability. I think one of the other, other big things is the introduction of uh, uh, enablers or interventions like GST. Yeah. And if you look at the uh, micro... Uh, segment, the MSME segment, clearly yeah. there are people are much more educated or aware about the fact that if they are today part of the formal economy, they have the ability to get accredited, rated and have better access to financing in which they can, you know, get better leverage to build their businesses further and get more profitable or, or, or have larger businesses at scale and leverage the economies of scale and run more profitable and larger businesses. So that that is again a journey and that is now becoming more and more evident to people. Again, initiatives where you are saying that, you know, look at my tax data like a GST and, and, and the government had announced a 59 minute loan. So if you're able to have that data with you, you can actually get a loan to further enhance your business as working capital and, and be better off for that. Now, these are again initiatives which are making sure that people start understanding. So it's not about me able to send money from point A to point B in a very efficient and quick manner, which is what instant payments have enabled. Instant payments have also now are getting recognized as the fact that they are creating a digital history, be it for the individual or be it for the entity. Now, any digital history which is getting created as transactional history has the ability tomorrow for me to be able to get credit against the same. So I think this linkage of data and transactional data to being able to get additional funding for my, my you know, business, uh, to be able to get a better working capital and getting working capital at better rates is becoming yeah. a very, very big linchpin. People trying to now say, let's be part of the formal economy. The benefits outweigh the the limitations which you would otherwise be calling about saying that my 
earnings are now becoming recognized and formal and therefore I have to pay a tax or, or I'm going to be taxed against the same. So I think that trend is coming. We are seeing better adoption. The numbers reported by the government are very clearly there to see. Uh, they are, yep. uh, the tax net has widened. It's become more broad based. And uh, I think uh, there is more recognition today because other than payment technology, which we all talk, talk about and, and whatever has happened in the ecosystem adoption of UPI and so on and so forth. The other part which is picking up big time is land tech. So credit technology, which is which is basically lending on technology, which purely means, you know, how is uh, data today being used to create surrogates for credit scoring is, is another factor which is becoming very relevant. Today, okay. even the fact that, uh, and I will, I will like to call out two uh, big sort of interventions over here. The first one being, uh, you know, recent and not so recent anymore, the account aggregator uh, guidelines given by the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, the clear idea over here is to create a data empowerment in the hands of the individual or the individual entity to be able to use their transactional data in the manner they deem fit to be able to avail financial services. So you're building an entire consent architecture, which is driven by a completely impartial entity where my data or my digital data from my institution can be provided to the institution from where I am seeking financial services like credit and loans and stuff like that. Now that is going to be a very important part. And very recently, which is recent as in, you know, as, 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 as uh, recent as two or three days ago, we are now also talking about the fact that people who are getting subsidy uh, and the PM has announced it, that can we look at providing them credit against it because they are getting some flows into their accounts and uh, what are they doing? And, and if we have visibility on that, what sort of cash? And this is the Kashi scheme, which the PM launched. And I think these are important aspects, yeah. which will again, you know, further re-emphasize both the value of uh, data, which means people will start valuing the, uh, uh, the outcomes that they can achieve uh, because of having a digital data history, which means they have to come into the formal financial economy and uh, what they can do with that data is going to be more and more important going forward. Very true, absolutely. Uh, Suresh, you talked about agent density and the system that was been given. Any country like India, if you were to uh, just, uh, you know, this agent density is extremely critical for the vastness and the remoteness that uh, people are uh, there. Uh, are living in and we have reached them out. The reach is very important. So there is no uh, no discussion on uh, uh, the density is uh, complete without talking about the Kirana stores or the moment stop pop stores as we call it. So what has been the impact of real time payments on micro businesses such as uh, the moment pop stores also known as Kirana stores and other businesses in unorganized sector. You see the real time payments today and and, and we tied upon it from the from the pandemic basis now it has become uh, very important today when people are not using cash because uh, there is naturally the challenge most of your consumption is not happening face to face uh, the mom and pop stores uh, over the last few months naturally footfalls have become almost zero in the, in the time of lockdown now, there are industries which are industries yeah. when I say I'm talking about more industry verticals, but ultimately the distribution is done at the mom and pop store. Now, how is that mom and pop store today selling their goods and services and how are they getting paid for that? Those business models have completely changed. Uh, you will see in your own vicinity, your, you know, uh, Mumbai used to be always famous, for example, uh, where wherever you are staying, it was very easy to have one Kirana store which you have identified and he would deliver your goods home and uh, you would basically pay from there. Uh, now, if you look at it, uh, there is today adoption of technology on one side for them to be able to display what are their wares, which means what is their inventory? What are they selling? What goods and services are available? Digital interfaces, yeah. applications are getting created, uh, which can be aggregated or which can be there for individual stores, uh, which is the birth of e-commerce. Where even small stores are today coming on to common sites and saying, okay, this is what we are selling. You can place your orders online. And more importantly, you can pay online. 
and that is where the yeah. real time payments have become very important because before the goods leave the leave the kirana store the kirana store has already got paid for the services similarly yes. if i take the flip side there are times when you receive the goods and you can do an instant payment and today a lot of times we are not even uh, interfacing or interacting with the delivery boy uh, the delivery boy is only meant to deliver goods but payments are happening directly with the kirana store so i think these things yeah. are becoming very very important and while yes. we keep saying it's contextual i think we are at the point of history when things are going to change for good in some of these areas and these will be behaviors these will be interventions which are there to stay and which i think in yes. the long run will play play a very important role in uh, upscaling the economy uh, i think absolutely suresh i think uh, they play a very very important role because at the end of the day the agent has to travel maybe 10 12 kilometers to reach that place whereas a kirana is just sitting there so you know so access becomes that much more easy so they they definitely play a, a, a big role uh, at this point may i request uh, harish uh, a very experienced banker to unmute and ask a question uh, good afternoon suresh hi harish uh, hi hi yeah, actually you know i uh, in fact in partly you have answered the question but uh, nevertheless you know today the inactive accounts you know in the banking system apart from jandan accounts you said was a staggering 48% right but they were overall a... not just jandan it was overall jandan actually uh, dormancy has come down it used to be 25% okay. it's down to 17% for some of the statistics but yeah that there is dormancy no doubt about it sure so then that, that's a very high percentage and i pre- presume that the classical definition of a, an active account would be that it would have transacted some uh, one transaction in the last 45 days or something like that as per npci right now so some of some of our uh, underlying metrics are actually more uh, relaxed at this stage we are looking at uh, the definition more towards being active in a year in a, you are looking at a you know almost a term of a year and i will i will touch upon it i would like to hear your question but i think you sure. also have touched upon a very important topic over here but carry on harish sure so today upi and aps are the essentially two two system payment systems which can actually enable any sort of payment with a mobile phone and without a mobile phone right and sure. any corner and any technically any corner of the country so despite that there is a problem of the explosion of payments upi or whatever number of transactions have gone up but the number of users are hardly you know when you see in the larger context it's concentrated on a few people right i mean at the end of the day so my take is that you know uh, for doing all of this there is big 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 challenge of financial literacy i'm not talking of digital literacy preceding digital literacy is financial literacy this is both uh, you know this is amongst the urban elite as well as probably rural right so i have been trying to you know get my hands around understanding what are the steps that you know are being taken by let's say reserve bank or whoever is required to you know propagate financial literacy but uh, i see that unless that question is addressed the you know benefits of uh, what you call all of these infrastructure and the payment systems etc primarily you know to actually propagate the velocity of money will be only sort of you know in theory right is my sure. sort of uh, question valid no no appropriate observation arish i think important clear importance clearly and uh, is to the fact of what you are pointing out is to broad base it today while we've seen an overall explosion of uh, some of these numbers uh, the question is how broad based it is and that is where we talk about uh, india and bharat and the divide over there on one side and the fact that how much of our population <clears throat> digital becomes i mean today when uh, while you were alluding to it that you know digital uh, literacy should be you know sort of uh, preceded not succeeded by financial literacy i think two somewhere have also become more hand in hand phenomena because digital has become a means by which you are being able to recreate the reach which otherwise would have been very difficult to do and therefore digital financial literacy to me you know becomes a sort of a continuum or or becomes joined at the hip but financial literacy definitely goes without saying because uh, when we 
uh, when we absolutely go to rural uh, to make people understand savings. So I think what point you are really pointing out to is that today when we go at a district and a village level, what is the product design we have? Are people really able to understand the products uh, that are applicable to them? Because a lot of our product designing and all is today happening for uh, target segments like ours or, you know, uh, which is more addressing the India part of the equation. So simplistic products, again, if we talk about whether it's insurance, whether it's credit, uh, sashitization of services because their consumptions are going to be much smaller than what they are over here, uh, which is where digital becomes an integral part because as you talk about low value tickets, you need to have scale. Uh, you need to have the ability to distribute in a much more cost efficient manner. Otherwise you will never be able to do it. So it's, it's all becoming a you know, continuum of trying to get more and more people into the fold designing products which are specific to them, which meet their needs and not have the factors which are running in urban India and, and trying to provide them similar products and just retrofitting it over there. And very importantly, digital literacy, uh, whether it is a government initiated effort is put together, I, th I think are very, very important for, for this journey to become Okay, if I may, and you know, I mean, if I may, if just for one more minute, I have, you know, been trying to sort of educate my maid servant as well as driver when I'm transmitting money into their accounts, right? And on the one hand, my driver is a spendthrift. So, you know, he just keeps spending money. He doesn't know how to read his bank statement. Whereas my maid servant, you know, is a saving money because, you know, I'm directly crediting it to her account, right? And she spends judiciously. So my, my take is that if we can actually educate both of them and, and you know, they go into a bank account or a bank account is not an intermediary sort of activity and the savings potential that these people have, you know, it can really do wonders for their confidence in the economy and what have you. So these are my personal observations, which I've seen, uh, you know, my driver doesn't know a debit or credit, you know, I, I keep telling him, please learn. Sure. <laughs> And yes, you're right that, you know, we need to have tailor-made solutions, but that I don't see any efforts, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, see, some are there, but maybe you're right. I mean, as long as even one person calls out and says it's not that broad-based, one, one has to really, you know, take it as such and, you know, build upon there. But, but you know, I'll again extend the example from what you were saying. So, you know, very relevant real-life examples. Now, if we, if we go to the villages, and while, while I know you refer to it in, in passing, saying to understand credit and debit, when you actually go to a village, they, they don't really understand savings as a savings, right? You have to make it goal linked. You have to tell them, for example, if you want to educate your child, you would need this much money. You need to build a kitty for that. So you're talking about very goal linked saving products. Uh, you are talking about, and, and you are uh, at times when we've gone and studied the villages, you're trying to replicate their behavior. Today, if you see a lot of places, people keep money in envelopes or in boxes, and they will say, this money is for education, this is for the marriage of a child, and they will try to build those kitties. So if we can build financial products which replicate or reinforce some of these behaviors, it makes a difference. Because if I'm just telling somebody, you know, here's a savings interest, it's unregulated, instead of 4%, I'll pay you 6%, you and I can maybe understand, but when you're going to the village, it has no meaning when you're talking about these in this language. So you have to actually talk about gold linked savings. You're talking about, for example, investment in gold. A lot of people, when you go to villages, they want to pay, put money in, in a different asset class. Now, what does it mean? How can you have gold linked saving? And you know, how can you do it digitally? How can you do, invest in gold even at a micro level and keep building it? Now, these products have been created but that digital literacy has to flow alongside it. So I'm giving a few examples which I have worked, you know, which, sure, which I've sure. actually seen and been to the villages and we talk about them in their language, structure the product in that way. But then again, that entire knowledge has to be far, far more broad based. Exactly the point. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Harish, quickly, before, before I think we're coming to the, uh, the hour of our show, but quickly, I, I think if you don't have this question, uh, that uh, you know the uh, I, IPPB 
can you uh, has played a game changing role in bolstering the rural economy no no doubt about it how has it leveraged the, the infrastructure personnel and reach of india and moved the rural savings uh, uh, you know banking system and unlock the economic value in the in the rural areas talking the larger you know depth and reach which which i think numbers i we referred to as we were in the course of our discussions yes, so yeah. clearly the rural infrastructure focus and penetration and, and i'll touch upon two three softer aspects here uh, what is uh, what was very important in pressing this institution into the service was the fact that dakia today uh, when you go to the villages is a son yes. of the soil and very much a part of the rural fabric so he is a person yes. who's probably grown in the same village or or have even seen you know uh, transgenerational dakias being there you know the grandfather was a dakia and today his uh, you know grandkid is still serving in the same village so the sort of trust secondly you know they understand today when we are talking about whatever uh, you know uh, points were raised with regard to digital literacy a lot of these people understand that these challenges exist so they become very important uh, input providers to say how do you really uh, structure the engagement and the dialogue with somebody when you have to explain them to start banking so they are a very important factor over there also so trust becomes number one the fact that they are trusted is is clearly the bedrock of the entire thing number two becomes the fact that they come from the same ecosystem they know the people they know their thinking uh, they know how to make them understand when we talk about you know literacy on these factors so that becomes very critical and third is the sheer scale you know one single institution yes. which actually has a sort of a sovereign recognition uh, you are not talking about a fragmented set of you know uh, 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 organizations out there uh, that providing services across the nation because clearly when we talk migrants and we've clearly seen the importance of portability of service provider becomes very critical today i could be on a migrant train and sitting in mumbai yes. uh, doing work on some say metro tomorrow i could be in kochi now if i am today having an account with a certain institution can i go ahead and operate it in kochi will somebody give me the same sort of service same sort of hand holding that pan india character becomes very critical of a single institution which has the underlying which has my underlying trust and i think these factors become very very critical to make the change thank you uh, we are we have like run out of time just just one question from one of the participants quickly if you can just take a minute or two uh, suresh your mic sure. so uh, it says that you know uh, while uh, indian uh, remittances typically upi has you know gone abroad uh, and many other many countries it is uh, getting implemented or already implemented statistics show that mpsa's international success has been limited to western union largely due to uh, due to safri comms alliance with the western union uh, uh, the western union the remittance company despite mpsa's massive success in kenya the penetration into international market is limited can you throw light highlight just one or two points why is it so i think the question kk again comes to everything that we have discussed till now you have to really see the success factors which went into mpesa becoming a success now naturally it is it is a pioneer in the sense that it was one of the forerunners in establishing and proving that something like this can work and can actually have an impact on livelihood so there are learnings out of it people have picked up different aspects of it and applied what was right or what was applicable in their various uh, ecosystems the reason i'm saying we discussed yes. it all along the course of our discussion is to clearly say like you your second question was that you know india is different right yes. india is different for so many yeah. reasons but yeah there are learnings out of kenya which we have applied right yes but we are not another mpesa we tried building mpesa over here with vodafone in india yes. but naturally the results yeah. were different the success was different because you are working in a different yes. ecosystem but the learnings that you get out of that those are universally applicable because you are talking about people you are talking about behavior you are talking about adoption you are talking about actual impact on livelihood and we know for a fact that in india also when we look at some of our self help groups and you know some of the success stories around it 
uh, we've seen that internet, digital, uh, having a mobile, these things have created empowerment for the women. And that is something we can see in the Kenya study also, that the moment women became empowered to run their own finances, to move money back and forth, uh, there was a significant impact in women-held households. And same we've seen the SNG story playing out over here. So parts of M-Pesa in different ways, learnings are very much applicable. But to say that you can lift the model out of one country and you know completely just put it in another country, I don't think that's feasible. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. I think uh, we had a wonderful session. Uh, we are close to the, uh, uh, we passed the hour, in fact. Uh, thank you very much for coming over. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, that um, remittance and ease of doing remit and ease of doing remittances uh, is very important for a large country like India. You know, it's such a large country with population uh, residing in deep, uh, the pockets. That's extremely important that we have a good remittance system, and and that's and that's coming. We should also thank M Pesa that they are the pioneers who created this, and that idea has come from there, you know. And so to, to that, and we are and many countries are doing are leveraging on that idea. India is also leveraging on India, and we've been a big success. And uh, people like Suresh and his uh, uh, you know the institution that he was heading has human service in bringing remittances. Uh, uh, to the uh, distant areas of India. Uh, with these words, I, I like to thank, please join me in thanking uh, Suresh. Uh, Suresh, thank you very much for coming over and have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, hope to see you some other time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks.